In this segment of the afternoon, our speaker will share his experience, strength, and hope, after which time we'll have a short break and return with the second segment at about 3.30, where Peter will talk more about steps 10, 11, and 12. So to share his experience, strength, and hope with us, I'd like to ask you to please welcome our special guest from Florida, Peter M. My name is Peter. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Cliff will be alive and sober. Um, Thank the folks for having me up here. Uh, Mark, who's floating around somewhere, um, got to see Mark's website and interesting picture of Mark, and I said, I'm going to get involved with this guy and get up to Toronto. may not be a good idea. Um, But uh, can you hear me okay back there? No? I'll try to talk louder. I have no voice. I apologize. But it's good to be here and um, excited about what we're going to be talking about in the second half of this, which is uh, 10, 11, and 12. And whenever I get to talk, it usually reflects around 10, 11, and 12 and where I am currently and what I'm doing currently. And the question I always like to ask folks is when I, when I uh, get to sponsor them is, where are you currently in the work? What's that look like? Um, how far into amends have you gotten? Uh, what sort of work did you do with your sponsor uh, before coming to me? And uh, very often it's uh, uh, not completing amends. There is no 11-step work or very little of it. Uh, they're not sponsoring anyone and don't have a sponsor. And they're pretty much uh, 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 going by don't drink and go to meetings, even though the ego tells them they're in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they're wondering why they're not getting well and why they, they, the further we get away from step one, have we moved further away from step one? Or is, has it driven us back into the need for power? So I'm very grateful uh, to share with you and report back to you uh, what God has currently doing for me and what the experience has looked like since I got here. Uh, God separated me on June 23rd, 1988 from alcohol. And I say for the last time because it is for the last time. And I, I'm an, an alcoholic in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I'm, I'm, I feel grateful to be here to share in your fellowship. But the school of thought that I was brought up in is we're looking for permanent sobriety. And even though our condition is 24 hours a day, that's how God put us here. It's not about keeping sober a day at a time. It's about per- experiencing permanent sobriety. And the only way we can really get there is by experiencing the sunlight of the Spirit or having a current experience with God. God could and would if he was sought. And what are we doing to seek this power called God? Am I using old experiences to keep me current? Am I giving lip service to this power called God? Or do I come from a spiritual place? interpret or judge, I just am. It's okay, God, let's go. When I get to do these things, folks ask me, what are you going to talk about? Are you nervous? I have no clue what I'm going to talk about. That's why I'm not nervous. Because the old adage is in AA, there's three talks. Is the one you do on the way to the meeting when you're getting dressed and you knock them dead, right? And then there's a talk you do on the way home. I should have said this and I should have said that. And then there's the talk you do, which you're never happy with anyway. So the only thing I do is work with prayer and meditation. I go into the bunker. I work with the fasting for about four hours before I do these and be an open vessel, and God will take where he wants to take me. So June 23rd, 1988, God set, separates me from alcohol, and I had no clue what this journey was going to look like. And 24 years later, I still don't, and I don't want to get involved with having my hands on a spiritual journey. You can't start a spiritual process with the answer. So I let go of all of that. And I can't volunteer where God's going to take me anyway because I don't know what that's going to look like because I don't know what the unknown's going to look like, but I walk. And I go with God's hand. He's taken me many places I never thought I would wind up doing or saying things I never thought I would wind up saying. But in the realm of God's spirit, it's always perfect. It completely contradicts the way I used to live before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, which was all about me. I was living all over page 62. It was com- I was completely consumed with me. I mean, I make an effort to make it. I was interested in you, and it looked like this. Let's not talk about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? I mean, that's how I operated, right? Yeah. 
But on my separation from alcohol in June of 1988, uh, I was not thinking about getting into my seventh and last treatment center. Uh, I wasn't thinking about going to a 12-step fellowship. I wasn't thinking about getting a sponsor and doing the 12 steps. And the only contact I had really with God from a, a very pure place was on June 23rd, 1988. Prior to that, it was God, give me what I want, and it didn't work out. There is no God. I lived as an agnostic. I would never say atheist because I wasn't, but an agnostic. But something changed in June of 1988 where this God who I had been cursing and damning to hell for all of my trouble, that same higher power I reached out to. And in June of 1988, I begged for help. The interesting thing happens to us when we're in that place. Where we're completely level and there are no reservations, a lurking notion, there's nothing left. It's completely empty. We're completely empty. That doesn't feel good. It actually feels like we're about to die. And we are. We're experiencing the death of self before the physical death. And that doesn't feel good. My teacher, one of my teachers would always tell me, if it feels good, it doesn't mean it's good. If it feels bad, it doesn't mean it's bad. June 23rd, 1980 was the worst I felt ever. It all came tumbling down. But it wasn't the physical stuff that was killing me. It was the emotional bottom that I finally hit was completely level that day. And I didn't know my spirit was screaming to get with other people and have conversations about how to get well. Prior to that, I never had a conversation about how do I get well, so how could I find those people? If God threw a hundred of them in front of me, I'd go around them. In June of 88, I was looking for people to have a dialogue with me about how to get well, and that meant God. That's why I love our fellow, my fellowship, the fellowship I belong to, because I'm with folks, as one gentleman said, who are journeymen in this thing. They're not just kind of gate crashing, seeing what's going on and out. We're in it. We're in the trenches. And our life revolves around this power called God. It isn't a bridge back to life. That means I use my fellowship and get out there and I forget about it. Everything comes from God. It is my life. And I'm able to do life because of my fellowship, because of my God, because of the 12 steps. I'm a, be- I'm a, better, I'm a better mate. I'm a better brother. I'm a better son. I'm an upstanding member of my fellowship. I'm a great worker. I'm a good sponsor. Everything that contradicted my way into Alcoholics Anonymous. And because this is my life, because God is my life, and I come from that God place, and I chop wood and carry water every day, I'm able to go out there and do as God would see fit, and I make mistakes. I make amends quickly. Not when it's convenient for me, but when it's right for you. It all allows me, all this work, all the stuff that I get to do, has brought me to one place, and that's stillness or or silence. Rather than listening to the noise in the head like most of us do, we operate out of noise, we operate out of fear, we live along the lines of uh, a human consciousness where everything we hear, see, and speak is from the mind. And the mind is fear-based and insecure. So when you're talking to me, I may talk to you about God, but I'm not coming from God, I'm hearing with the mind. When I'm listening to you, I may talk about God, but I'm listening with the mind. And my actions reflect that. All of it, all my actions come out of what my mind is telling me. All fear, all agnostic, all insecure, all egotistical. Big Book says God doesn't make too hot terms, so I don't live life on life's terms. I fail miserably. I need a drink to live life on life's terms. That's why I drink in order just to fit in. Living life on God's terms, we're coming from a place of God conscious. It's a raised level of awareness. Coming from deep down within a place called stillness, which is the only place we can ever experience this power called God. That's one of the reasons, many reasons why we meditate. To experience that. And if we can walk into our homes, occupations, affairs, coming with that God place, we will quickly see how that's contagious. And how we affect people in a positive way rather than infecting people the way we used to. Big Book says we can't transmit something we haven't got. We will what we do, and that's untreated alcoholism. You see the sponsor who's untreated, you'll see his little stable of prospects who are unstable, who are untreated, 
who are restless, ill, and discontented. When you see the awakened guru in your fellowship who has people like that, they're sponsoring, you'll see how that will trickle down. So living in all three sides of the triangle, going through the steps over and over again, working with a life of prayer and meditation, living in all three sides of the triangle allows me to be whole and complete, which brings me back to silence, which is our natural state of beingness when you think about it. We invent noise, we create noise, we get attached to noise, we get attracted to noise, we're operating out of noise all the time. And somehow in Alcoholics Anonymous we go through the steps and they have this thing called meditation and prayer, which allows me and requires me to get completely still. My first drink came when I was uh, 14 years old. I grew up in New York, Brooklyn, New York. And uh, prior to my first drink, I was like most of us, restless, irritable, and discontented, driven by a hundred forms of fear. I had voices talking to me. I didn't even know who they were, but they were always talking to me. And none of it was ever good. The voices would always tell me about how I was less than. How I can't fit in. I don't have a shot at living life successfully. I would hear people talking about doing great things or plans and designs for their life. And I said, wow, how are they so fortunate? How do they believe in that stuff? How are they going to pull that off? Because I'm Peter Marinelli. It's never going to happen. You know, I got good intentions, but it's never going to happen. I'm not that smart. I'm not that ambitious. I would hear teenagers talk about getting driver's license and dating and going off to college. And it just seemed so appealing, dating, a a car, going off to college, having a career. I can't do that. I'm Peter Marinelli. There's no way I can pull this off. I'm me. When God finds out me, I'm not going to be able to do this. And as I got old, I would hear adults talking about adult things, and I'm now entering into this adult, and they were talking about having careers already. I'm just about tying my shoelaces. They're graduating college and getting the second car. I'm still on public transportation. I mean, I, just to hold down a job was a big deal. Marriage, children, oh, my God, I cannot do life. I can't do this. And during my drinking days, twice I tried to check out of life. And God had other plans, interrupted my death. But uh, 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 the spring, summer, uh, uh, I was 14 years old, and about six months prior, January 23rd of 1973, my mom, who's alcoholic, was alcoholic, and addicted to uh, Valium back in the day, um, couldn't get sober. We didn't even identify her as an alcoholic because women aren't alcoholics in my family, let alone addicted to pills. And no woman who was married to my dad was ever going to be tagged as an alcoholic. It just wasn't going to happen. So we kept the pink elephant in the living room. And we would go to psychiatrists, to sanitarium, to psychiatrists, to sanitarium, to hypnotists, all kinds of stuff to keep away from the drink. And they prescribed Valium not to drink. So you know what we do. We do both. And what my mom experienced is what all of us experience. Incomprehensible demoralization. I didn't realize how problem, her turmoil that she had to go through until I became an adult. When I realized I couldn't even be a brother to my younger brothers and a son to my dad, I could only fathom, only imagine how a woman must have felt not being able to be a mother to her three sons or a wife to her husband because Jack Daniels was her God. Valium was her God. And so she tried several times to take her life in the morning of January 23rd, 1973. She finally did it. And I remember waking up that morning to sheer terror. I mean, I was literally frozen in bed, laying in my lower bunk. And my brother was up above me. My youngest brother was on the other side of the room. And the three of us didn't know what to do. And I was frozen with fear. And what really scared me, my dad is a real tough guy, street guy. Never saw him cry, never saw him become afraid of anything. And when he was on the 911 call to the police, hearing this man wailing over the phone, screaming, my wife is dead, send an ambulance. That just struck me frozen. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My life changed forever after that day. My design for living, if you will, was my mom. I mean, she would take me to the Little League and take me to music practice and take me around. And I would talk about the birds and the bees with my mom because I wasn't going to talk to my dad about it. And then suddenly she's gone and I was completely empty. What do I do? How do where do I go from here? I got a guy at home cunning, baffling and powerful. He's dad. My uncles followed in his kind of uh, way of operating. There was no, no, I, I was into music and art and creative things. And my dad was a street guy. What do I do? My dad never picked up a baseball glove, 
I'm sure he picked up a few baseball bats, but that's a whole other thing, right? Um, never picked up a, a, a glove or anything, and so it was a little different, you know. I showed up to the corner one Saturday night. My friends were drinking beer, and they were drinking cold 45 beer, and my dad had warned me many, many times not to drink with the bums on the corner. He didn't want me sing, he, hanging around those guys, being seen with those guys. And he didn't want me hanging around the girls who were drinking with the guys on the corner. I happened to find those women very attractive to me, right? This one Saturday night, the court went around. I put my hand in, I took a few pops off the court, and it went down and nothing happened. I remember thinking, I know, I just know the cops are going to turn the corner. I'm going to get arrested. If they don't turn in the corner, I know my dad's definitely going to catch me drinking on the corner. I'm going to get a beating. But I took a few pops off the court. No one showed up. Nothing happened to me either, so I drank a little bit more. And you know what happens. I start to get nice. Everything gets nice. I got nice. She got nicer. Right? <laughs> right? Growing up in Brooklyn, my hero that summer went from like Mickey Mantle to like Al Pacino by the end of the night. And uh, I had arrived, as, as Bill Wilson says, I love the effect produced by alcohol. Um, I didn't... I. I love the effect produced by alcohol. That's why I went return to it. That's why we drink. I like the effect produced by what I'm putting in my body so I can just pack into the stream with you, so I can just take a shower. I need to be a little bit jacked up in order just to do that. Just to operate, to get up and go to work, I need something. I can't face the world empty. I cannot do it. That's why I don't get so many of our members in our fel respective fellowships just put the plug in a jug or don't use and go to meetings. You're still doing life without a substance and no God. How do you pull that off? Perhaps that's why you're driven by a hundred forms of fear and we look like drunks without a drink in us. We're still manipulating, lying, cheating, stealing, but we didn't use and we're winners. No, we're not. Perhaps more dangerous to others when we're not using. We were predictable when we were using. We used just to fit in. And that's how it was for me. I drank a love effect produced by alcohol, so I returned to it, not knowing where it was going to take me to the gates of hell. I didn't know I stepped onto a road paved to hell with something called phenomenon called craving, mental obsession and spiritual malady. Never heard of these words before. But I love the effect produced by alcohol. My friends uh, uh, called it a night, that summer night. I remember going into like this, this anxiety thing. We're going to end this. This is getting nice. I like this. Don't end it. And I remember it was a long walk home, but the next morning was a Sunday morning, and I went into this park to play basketball. And I remember how I felt walking into that park. It was like, it was unlike any other morning I ever experienced. I found a panacea for my ill Saturday night. I knew I can do the rest of the week, because the following Saturday I was going to go back to my cold 45 beer, capture that elusive feeling, I'm going to be okay, even for a few hours. I can be okay for a few hours. And I obsessed on the following Saturday the rest of the week. I remember thinking going through school like I don't care what you say about me I don't care what you think about me I don't care how much you push me around I know come Saturday I'm going to escape it all I'm going to get to that place out there that's how I was able to do life and I drank on Saturday again and I drank on Saturday again and then started drinking on Friday and then Thursday and then Wednesday and suddenly I was drinking a lot and I went from cold 45 beer to wine, and then I found vodka, and I went through the whole thing, Swiss up and all this other nasty stuff. And then one day, a bunch of years later, I landed with uh, my greatest lover ever before I got sober, and that was something called Jack Daniels, uh, which took me to a place indescribably wonderful. Right? My, I remember... Uh, uh, the following Saturday rolled around and I drank, and the following Saturday rolled around and I drank, and as I said, it progressed into Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, but I couldn't get there anymore. I mean, I was getting drunk. I was getting blind drunk, and I was starting to get in trouble, but I couldn't capture that first innocent drunk. It was gone forever. I didn't know it back then. There were some consequences because of my drinking as well. Uh, as I said earlier, I have two younger brothers. They idolized me growing up. They listened to the music I did. They followed me around. They played stickball with me. They did all the things that they would, you would do growing up in Brooklyn. And I protected them. And my dad pretty much had not too many worries about me. But as alcoholism does what alcoholism does, and we become more and more selfish and self-centered and self-seeking, there are consequences because of my behavior. 
And my younger brothers started to become afraid of me. Then they became embarrassed by how I was behaving when I was drunk. At the get-go, I was a nasty drunk. At the end, you wouldn't even know I was in the room. I'd just go down and just leave me there. But at the beginning, I was full of anger, a lot of venom at this guy called God for mom leaving about my plight in life. I was really, really restless and discontented, and everyone got it. My brothers became afraid of me. They would tell my dad. My dad would corner me the next day and read me the riot act about what's going on with you. What are you doing with your life? And like a good alky, I would wait for him to get done. When he was done, I'd go back out, and that would give me more reason to drink. This thing called life is not for me. I need to get out. One morning I woke up and uh, I needed some money like usual. And uh, I stole, uh, I started stealing from my family. And I stole one of my dad's checks out of his checkbook. And I got away with it. I would go down to the local store and forge his name. They all knew my dad, so they give me the money. I said, okay, pull this off once. I can do this again. I start stealing checks from my dad's checkbook. And I go to the local delicatessen local store, they'd cash it, and I'd get some beer, or whatever I needed to get. And uh, I did this for a little bit of time, thinking like those checks just went into the universe and no one ever saw them again. Right? But they were checking statements, and all that stuff came back to my dad, and then he found all these, they used to send the, heart, the, the, the check back with the big rubber stamp on the back, and they got all these forged checks. And my dad came looking for me. Now, this is not the type of guy you want looking for you. Tony Soprano looks like Tinkerbell next to my dad. Right? And I remember I was sitting in a car uh, one day next to this young lady and um, thinking I was a big shot until my dad drove up and he got out of the car. It's kind of like Robert De Niro showing up, you know, and got a Goodfellas and a cigarette went down. This is the only guy who goes to a fight with a pinky ring, sunglasses and gold jewelry. I mean, this is how he shows up for a fight. And when his eyebrow goes up and he looks at you, just run. Right? His eyebrow went up, the cigarette went down, and I was in serious trouble. And he did this, screamed my name, and I says, Honey, <laughs> that's my dad. You talk to him. I'm running away. And I, <laughs> and, uh, and off I went, and I got about, you know, 20 feet. My dad screamed my name loud enough for me to, to freeze. And um, I went to my first treatment center. That's how I went to treatment. I went to treatment not because I conceded to my innermost self I'm an alcoholic and I need to go to any lengths to find a spiritual experience so I can speak from a podium someday in Toronto, Canada. How cool is this? Right? I went to my first few treatment centers because my dad was after me. The wrong people on the street were looking for me. Or I just had enough. But I didn't want to quit. Conceding to our innermost self is not enough. Having a powerful desire to stop is not enough. It'll bring me to the doorway. It'll make me ring your doorbell. It'll add, come, make me come to you in a meeting and say, can you help me? But still not enough. There's a difference between God's grace and being spiritually fit. One we get because we're one of his children. We inherit God, if you will. We get the DNA of God. But then there's some work to be done. In vision for you, it talks about patience, willingness, and labor. Labor, last I checked, is put my hands on the wheel and driving, doing some work. Chopping wood and carrying water and plow the field. And getting it fertile. It didn't, won't happen through osmosis. So even with the powerful desire to stop, wasn't enough. Conceding wasn't enough. But back then, my first few treatment centers, I was nowhere near conceding or having a powerful desire. I just wanted to get out of there for a little while, which is what I did. Now, back in the States, back in the day, the insurance companies would give you the 28-day rehab deal. Where they got this from, I don't know, but it doesn't work. But they said, 28 days, Pete Marinelli, off you go. 27, you can stay to 28. We won't kick you out. And 29 is way too long. So 28, good to go. Now, I don't think I have a problem. They give me all these charts and graphs about how my brain metabol my body and my brain metabolize alcohol. They gave me all these charts and graphs. And I said, that's good. Thanks for the information. After watching that, I really need a double, right? So 28 days later, I get out and I had that girl meet me at the door. And it was, honey, I'm coming home like I did a bit in a prison somewhere, right? I was in some fancy treatment center in Long Island, New York. They had a big gymnasium, 
They had a little fitness center. They served us our meals. We had our own little bed. It was, you know, everyone walked around proper. There were big guys with white jackets on. You don't want to get them angry. But it was this nice little place, maybe a hundred acres of property. And you'd go for little walks. And so I treated it like I went to jail. And 28 days later, I got out and she brought a jug. I cracked the seal and quiet about AA and drank. And the phenomenal cold craving was right back on me as if I kept drinking for 28 days. Yeah. Being separated from alcohol has little to do with becoming a recovered alcoholic. Well, being a recovered alcoholic just means I'm separated from the substance. I sat in plenty of jail cells upon my release. You weren't looking for me to sponsor you. I sat in the tombs in New York for about three days waiting to see the judge. I hadn't used anything, sick as can be, on my release. I didn't use three days. You don't want me to sponsor you. The consequences started to get worse and worse and worse. It wasn't my dad looking for me, but I, now I have one treatment center. My dad would send out search parties now. My brothers were hip to what I was doing. My aunts and uncles were hip to what I was doing. Even my grandparents who were from Europe and spoke a little English knew there was something wrong with their grandson. So I had to hide my using now. And the interesting thing is, some of the contemporary belief systems are, don't, you, don't drink or don't use and go to a meeting. Well, that does nothing to remedy the hurt and pain we've caused other people. It's narrow-minded and selfish, because even after my first treatment center, I was infecting and affecting my entire family. Everything shifted. The balance of the family completely shifted. It was upside down as it was after burying mom, but now I complete the job. My family was completely upside down. How in God's name could I get this message? come into a sacred fellowship and say, I didn't use, I put the plug in a jug, and I'm good. My amends to you is I'm not using. That might not pay the bill in a lot of places. And here's the thing. If we're truly on a spiritual path, and we're truly claiming we have God in our life, and we're truly living, coming from a God place, there is no way that I can just put the plug in a jug, go to a meeting and not repair, make an attempt to repair the damage I've done. This is why I like having dialogue and conversations with people who are God-like, who walk with God, because they're always talking about a life of service, which is where my God has brought me to. And if we think about it, as messengers of God, it's no longer about being here to be served, but it's about serving, serving in all we do, my home's occupations and affairs. You've been kind enough to invite me here and give me some pretty good digs where I'm staying, and Mark's been wonderful since I got here, but I'm here for service. I'm not here for applause. I'm not here for pats on the back. It's nice to get that, but this is part of my life of service. And there's plenty of times I get on a plane and it's 90 degrees in, in South Florida. I'm headed to the snowstorm in Nebraska. It's a little tough to put my first foot on that plane. But I have a life of service and my spirit moves me there, demands I do that. I don't get how many of us just show up at a meeting and say, I'm good, going home. And haven't taken the kids to a ball game or taken the wife for a romantic dinner in years. Or just sit home and watch TV with the family and pack into the stream. I love some of our AAs who are fortunate enough to have children and spouses. And they have date night. They have family night. And they just hang around. But they're packing into their nest again where we were absentee for years. Ain't that great? And it's about giving back. It's about giving back. It's about giving back. That's what this life is really all about when we're on this path. I sounded just like that little kid when I first got in here, by the way. No drink. What are you? <clears throat> I got into my second treatment center, and I got into my third treatment center, and um, <clears throat> got into a fourth treatment center, and got into a fifth treatment center. And along that way, I got a job as a, uh, my dad uh, was a longshore. My whole family were dock workers. Rough crowd. Rough people associated with that. A lot of uh, 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 people you don't want to hang around with who are associated with that industry. And I was right in the thick of it, right in the middle of all of it. And I went to work for my dad, who have, for years, this impeccable reputation. He was the boss. He had about 500 dock workers working for him. Now, they didn't send out emails or office notices. You bark to get things done. It was a rough environment. A lot of uneducated men down there who were interested in one thing, money. 
It wasn't about having a talk with Jody employee because he's not performing. You didn't perform, you got fired or beat up. I mean, this is a type of environment. So I wasn't going to find any kind of spiritual enlightenment in this position. And I went to work for my dad, and in a short time, my dad started to experience shame, embarrassment, remorse, guilt. Because he was watching me disintegrate in front of him. Now I'm working with my dad. His office was about 100 yards, maybe less from where I had my job. And I, he would see me every single day. He would see me come in from the night before with my head on sideways or in the same clothes and wondering really what's going on now. I would borrow money from people associated with that environment who I really have no business being in their company. And I would name drop and they would give me some money. But they used to look for me every week to give them a little bit back till you paid off the whole loan. And if you didn't have that money, you got beat up. And my dad would get me out of these scrapes. In the environment I worked, there were a lot of loose goods. So you would take stuff that didn't belong to you. And the alcoholic mind would say, well, there's plenty. They won't miss one or two. The same thing when I would rip off my family. Well, my dad has plenty of money. My brothers have some money. What's a little bit of this or a little bit of that? Why would alcoholism, why would my addictive mind allow me for a moment to have some compassion for how I'm hurting you? It doesn't exist in the same room. It can't. And the ego needs to breathe. And the alcoholic and addicted mind needs to do what it has to do. And it has no room for compassion and understanding. Or we'll get like that little thread that says it shouldn't do this. But it's overwhelmed by, we'll, do, we'll fix it later. Right now, I got to do what I got to do. Or many times, no compassion, not even a seed, is, it shows up. This is how I operated. And I wasn't the worst of the worst out there. There were people who were criminals who were out there but enough damage to hurt people. I had a job as a dock worker impossible to get fired from, and I got fired twice. And my dad fired me twice. And the second time was, I can't have you around here anymore. I got thrown out of my house, and I was basically left to fend for myself on the streets. And I, this is where the bottoms raise. And uh, my dad came to the rescue, though, and uh, got me this little studio apartment in Brooklyn. And this is uh, during my fifth stay in a treatment center. And he got this little studio and furnished it for me and got me clothes and all the things you would need to kind of get going. And uh, as soon as my dad drove away, I sold a color television and I sold a clock radio and I sold the shoes and boxes and I sold the clothes and garment bags. I tried to carry out the refrigerator one day. And I was renting out this apartment and I never paid rent, almost burned the place down. And I had all walks of life showing up at all hours. You know, screaming my name whether I owe them money or they had some stuff for me or they just needed a place to crash. And my landlord was a young fella who was married, uh, had a little daughter with his wife, and his wife was expecting, and I rent from them. And they couldn't get rid of me. And then one day they just threw me out. I spent nine weeks in this fifth treatment center, and I always like to talk about this a little bit. Nine weeks I was in a treatment center, and I didn't need a drink. My body did not need alcohol. My body did not need any other substance. And because this is CA, I will tell you that there, I went through about three treatment centers of detoxing off of heroin and cocaine and, and, and pills. Valium was the thing of the day. I don't even know what they're using out there now, but uh, I shot heroin and cocaine for, for too long. And uh, the detoxes were just, I was notorious for the worst detoxer on the planet. And after my fifth treatment center, I said no more. But I could not get away from alcohol. I could not get away from I would curse it, swear off, throw the bottles against the wall and say no more. And I would run back. And I was drinking Mr. Boston Blackberry Brandy at the end. But uh, my fifth treatment center, I was up there for nine weeks. I would have given you a clean UA and a passive breathalyzer in five minutes. I even put on, put on weight. I started to actually look healthy. I was able to hold down some food, and I would go to the group and talk about my dysfunctional family, my inner child, my issues and my triggers, and all this nice stuff that, that we do in treatment. I'm in the business, I know. Right. And they would take me to art therapy, and they would give me dance therapy. This is not a good idea when you have crackheads and junkies and alkies detoxing, and we're going to dance today. Not a good idea. Uh, 
I always, my favorite story is they took us to the gymnasium and it was about this size and there were baskets on each end with a basketball and the ball rolled from one end of the gym to the other and therapy sounded like this, I'm not getting it, you get it. And we went out and smoked a cigarette and that was pretty much physical therapy. Um, but they try to do all these things to kind of get us motivated and try right thinking and understand why. Do you understand, Peter, why you drink so much? Yes, give me a double. You know, it didn't work. I was lacking the spiritual transformation. And that's only going to begin when I bottom out. When self-reliance is completely removed, that there's nothing in my mind, nothing in my mind that says perhaps one day I can maybe control and enjoy it. Maybe if I just regulate, maybe if I just mix it with other stuff, maybe if I just go on marijuana, I mean, it's just something. I just need something. I just won't go to those extremes. That needs to be removed. It's a complete breakdown of the inner self, where there's nothing. And at that point, we start to build, because the only place we can reach out to is this power called God, whatever our conception is, no matter how limited it is. And it could be G-O-D, group of drunks for good or early direction, but it's something other than me that I'm reaching to, something other than my thinking mind that I'm reaching out for help for. Right? It's the mustard seed of willingness that we can move a mountain. When I come to you and say, please help me, or I show up at an AA meeting or an NA meeting or a CA meeting and say, listen, I can't do this, I'm done, please help me. And I start to take direction from my elders. Even when I disagree with the direction, I'm quiet and follow. I chop wood and carry water. It's when we start having skepticism and doubt and reservations on the information or direction you're giving me, I have a first step problem again. And I see this so often in AA. And when I give talks in CA, when people come up to you, they're sober double digits, they're sober three, four years, and they can't get past themselves. And then they, they unload on you for 10 or 15 minutes, they give you an entire fifth step, and you say, why don't you try doing this? And then their head tilts and they don't want to do it. So you just took up 10 minutes of my life to unload, I'm giving you a way out and you still don't want to do it. Constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. They're waiting for the silver bowl, the magic bowl, for someone to say, I would do the same thing you're doing. I'll go with you. It's not going to happen unless that person is sick or sicker than you. Rubber hits the road when we get into the steps. I think the 12 and 12 says something like when we're 6 and 7. It happens way before that. For some of us, it happens just walking through the door to a group of strangers. What do I do? And then we find out how much in common we have. This is the only place, whether it's CA, NA, or AA, where we, I tell you the worst things I've done in my life, and you say, here's my number, give me a call. <laughs> when Mark picked us up, there was Mark, Marion, and myself, and we were sharing little escapades that we did, kind of laughing about it. Got picked up to come to the hotel with uh, the gentleman who opened up. I don't know where he went. We were talking about how much we would drink. Mary and I went to a restaurant, and they're pushing wine. And I said, as long as you got a lawyer to go along with a bottle of wine. And we were laughing about how much we drink. Now, if you were out there at a dinner party, say, oh, my God, you have a drinking problem. We know we have a drinking problem. It doesn't come as a shock to anyone. Okay? We come into Alcoholics Anonymous, CA or NA, and we expect, we, we're always told, don't leave till the miracle happens. You're sitting in a meeting of a 12-step fellowship. The miracle's happened. Because by everything based on your past, you're not supposed to be sitting with a bunch of other recovering or recovered folks. We're supposed to be using based on everything we've done up until that moment. But here I am sitting in an AA or an NA or a C, whatever A it is, there. Even if we're drunk, even if we're high, we're sitting in a meeting talking about God and recovery. The miracles happen. Now what? Here's where the weight falls on the elder statesman. What are we going to do about him or her? Give them a quarter, tell us to call us when they want to use. They're not going to do that. Say, here's my phone number. Call me when you feel like using. If you're like me, I'm not calling Ernie when I want to use. I'll call him to bail me out of jail when I'm done. With me? So when they come in here, I need to recognize there's a newbie, maybe first time in here. What am me? What am I going to do about it? Leave it to the rest of the folks? No, I go over and meet them. And I'll spend some time with them. Maybe it's their first meeting ever and they're scared to death. I know I was. I'd bail. 
And I would go to AA meetings drunk a few times back in Brooklyn. No one ever said, oh, my God, you're drunk. Get out. They just keep coming, keep coming. Come to, they took me to the diner drunk. They knew I knew I was drunk. They knew I was drunk, but they just sat with me because they saw themselves in me. It just wasn't my time until June of 1988. Five treatment centers, nine weeks away uh, in this treatment center, and I still can't get sober. In fact, in six treatment centers, I managed a total of two days of continuous sobriety. After treatment center number five, I was discharged on a Saturday. I got till Monday and picked up a drink, Mr. Boston, Blackberry Brandy. I beelined to liquor store. I couldn't take it anymore. You know that feeling where well, you got a couple of days and then you just bust out. I can't, I can't do this. I'm crawling out of my skin. Now, after nine weeks of being in treatment, I was not experiencing any kind of post-acute withdrawal syndrome. There was nothing. I looked fit as a fiddle. I was in good shape. Nine weeks, put on weight, had some complexion. My eyes were clear. My body did not need alcohol, but the mind was so powerful, the obsession was still going. My body felt like it needed alcohol. The mind will convince me my body is sick when it isn't. And yet we rely upon the mind in our sacred fellowships over and over and over again. When we tell a newcomer, bring the body and the mind will follow. The last thing we need showing up anywhere is your mind. (laughs) Yeah. That I'll drink to. <laughs> Bring the body to the mind to follow it. It may problem centers. Powerful instrument. Convince me my body is sick and I need to get need to get straight. Need a drink, whatever it is. Convince me of a lot of things, fear based and insecure. The same mind that'll take me back to that which is killing me over and over and over again. I tell a newcomer rely upon that same guy to outthink a drink. Play the tape to the end. Remember where you come from. Keep it green. Oh, my all-time favorite, filled with self-centeredness and self-seeking, is take a hospital or detox commitment so you can remember where you come from. Really. So I'm using the horrors that they're experiencing for my selfish and self-centered reason. I look at you and say, I'm grateful I'm going home. We missed something on that one. I'm going there to help you, serve you, not so I can keep it green. In fact, I don't need to keep it green. I don't need to remember where I come from. I don't need to play the tape through. I don't want to first because my mind is the one who's doing it. But God has set me free of that. Step 10 promise. We've recovered in a position of neutrality, safe and protected, having even sworn the stuff off. The problem has been removed. A lot of us walk around, I was one of them for years, afraid of using again. Well, of course we're afraid of drinking and all that, that, that comes with it. But when we sit down and get really quiet, why are we afraid of picking up when God has the problem removed? It's not a problem anymore. We're not powerless anymore. We have tremendous amount of power. That'll ruffle feathers at a lot of our middle of the road meetings tough. We're here to speak truth. And as long as I'm spiritually fit and living and growing and understanding and effectiveness, living in the sunlight of the Spirit, God's got that. God took the the loaded gun away from me. I have to walk around hoping, is it going to go off? Is it not going to go off? Problem's been removed. My job is to get spiritual wings and go pack into the stream, home occupations and affairs, and go pass this message on and shout from the rooftops about God and not apologize for God, whether it's in AA, NA, wherever I am. We should be walking examples of this power called God and nothing less than that great fact. We don't need to apologize for our past behavior, not when we're living and immersed with God. Hmm? It was a long road to get there. meant the destruction of self. And the ego gets grinded into dust. Self must die. The mind must shut down. It peaks up once in a while. It speaks up once in a while. No longer attached to it. Living present with bread, chop wood, carry water. What do I do next? What do I do next? Okay, God, let's go. Where are we going next? It allows me to not have a leap of faith in life. You ever hear this one? It's a leap of faith. Where in the big book does it say leap of faith? If it does, please show me. What leap of faith? Is it not God who's telling me, take the leap? Ernie, take the leap. God speaking. Ernie, take the, the leap, right? So God inspires me to do it. Who's on the other side of the leap? God. In gravity, in God's world, there's no gravity. Who's holding me up? 
God. Who's on the other side? God. Who's at the beginning? The whole thing's a God movement. I'm just stepping into an unknown. And there's greater pain in not changing than the change itself. So I take a look back at my alcoholic mind and how it operates. I won't change. I'll stay where I am. Pain, humiliation, degradation. And then God says, go. And we kind of put our foot in the water with our eyes closed saying, not too bad. Put another foot next thing you know we're on the other side. No leap of faith. The neat thing about living this way, when we're in the sunlight of the Spirit, there are challenges. We look at them. How am I going to do this? Okay, God, let's go. Bring me to it and through it. It's your will that I'm here. So it's all good. I've landed in places. I do this about 30 weekends a year. And I've landed in parts of the world where I say, I really got myself into it this time. They're talking about going looking for moose after the session's over. I mean, I, you know, how do I, where am I, you know, where am I? And I've been in places where they put me up in hotels that, you know, they're smoking crack maybe next door. It happened to me in Maryland. They said, we're going to bring you to a finer hotel. It was a crack hotel. Right? <laughs> One o'clock in the morning, I'm switching hotels. But sometimes you land in places and you go, oh, maybe I did too much. And then you get still. Usually call a sponsor after prayer. Who sent you the invitation? Why are you there? Then go do God's work. And we'll go in protected and come out protected. And perhaps wake up somebody along the way. Off I go. Off I go. For fun and for free. I was living on the streets for a while. One night in the street is too long for anyone. It was a nightmare. Living on the streets, panhandling. And I don't say that for, you know, for prideful reasons. It's just where my story was. And lost contact with my family. The day my dad told me, don't come back, I remember I was sitting in his car, and I said, Dad, can you loan me 20 loan? I had the audacity to say loan. I wasn't getting it back, but, you know, you kind of pepper it with loan. And I says, Dad, can you loan me 20 bucks? And he looked at me, and I never forget, he looked at me, eyeball to eyeball, and he says, no. And I got to take care of my brothers. You can't come home anymore. I'm, I'm homeless as it is. And I got out of his car because I would not argue with him. So, okay, and I slammed the door and I walked away and I remember thinking the most awful things how I'm going to get back at this guy. I'm going to make him pay for this. I'm going to make my brothers pay for it. I'm going to make everyone pay for it because that's all I can think of was hate. It wasn't until I got sober and cleared up a little bit that I realized the broken heart that a father would have to tell his firstborn, don't come home anymore, you're not welcome like that. And how my brothers and I, who are so close today, how it broke their heart to say, don't come home anymore, you're an embarrassment. How my youngest brother, is a true story, I call my house on a blind drunk in Staten Island, New York. I was on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning. I meant to call someone else to borrow money. And somehow I rang, and uh, my brother picked up the phone. And my youngest brothers uh, uh, took right after my dad. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And I was calling from a public phone, and um, I said, this is where I am. Can you bring me some money? He said, yeah, I'll be right down. I'll bring you money. He came with two Cadillacs, two guys driving, two big Cadillacs, give you an idea of the type of crowd that was coming to look for me. This is my baby brother. He gets out of the car. It's a true story. He had a pistol in his pants, and he says, where are you buying this stuff from? He's going, I'm going to go up there and kill him first. I'm going to come down. I'm going to kill you before they kill you. And he had foam in his mouth. He was in a rage. And I don't know if he's capable of really doing that, but that's where it brought him, that he had a gun on him. He was going to kill his drug dealer, and he was going to kill me. This is what we do to people who love us. This is where we bring them to, into our sewer. Whether it's Park Avenue or a park bench. This kid and I are like this today. We're close as ever. And one of his friends interceded and kind of got him back to reality for a moment. And my brother put me in a car and took me home. And the language he used towards his older brother for about an hour drive was disgusting. And I deserved it all. And then I had to face the music with my other brother and my dad. And they had nothing but venom for me. But can you blame them? This is what we do. How could I come to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or CA and say, I didn't drink today, I'm aware? Because they're stuck with the mess. 
We go off to our glorious fellowships, our sacred fellowship. We get this message. We pack into the stream of life. We, have, we look good. We sound good. We, we find romance even. We do lots of things. And they're stuck with, what about us? How do we process this? How do we put this stuff back together? We're stuck with a war zone. Can you come in and help us rebuild at least? When we're in the sound of the Spirit, we're the one with a pick and chisel saying, I got it. You sit back. I will fix this. That's living along the lines of God consciousness. So I was homeless for a while, and I wound up uh, outside the Port Authority in Midtown Manhattan. I had a moment of clarity, blind drunk. I have a moment of clarity, and God strikes us sober. It's the flimsy reed. I didn't know it was the loving and powerful hand of God. It was this flimsy reed. And then the flimsy reed was delivered with a moment of clarity, a moment of sanity. And I realized the condition I was in. And I hadn't spoken to my family for a while. I was homeless. I was a bum. I tried twice to take my life in hotel rooms. I can't die right. I can't get sober. And now I can't even get drunk. I'm drinking just to exist. I was really at the bitter end. And um, in this moment of cloud, I remember thinking of my dad and my brothers and my family. And it was as if, you know, the, the life passed before your eyes kind of deal. I don't know what happened to me afterwards. I remember cursing God. And a couple of weeks later, I would say, I'm not sure, I was in the back of another hallway. This is how I was living, the back of hallways. I was too afraid to walk in the streets and to do things. I'd get a jug hallway, get a jug hallway, get a jug hallway. And I was in the back of this, this, this disgusting, filthy hallway in lower Manhattan. And um, I was done. That was June 23rd, 1988. And the same God I had cursed or entirely ignored was the same God. If you're out there, please take me from this. And the words, I never forget what I offered was, I don't want to die. Hmm? I wasn't thinking about any of this. I just don't want to die. And I welcome the idea of dying for years. I don't want to die. Today, I don't want to die. I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know what I have to do not to die, but I don't want to die. And then God had the journey. See, the journey is laid out for us. The path is already out. We just have to be awake enough to say, there it is. Or awake enough and willing enough to say, okay, Ernie, you know the path. I don't know. Can you just point me in the right direction? God has the journey. Talking to someone earlier about having a purpose in life, when we see the journey and we're clear, we have a life of purpose. And when we have a life of purpose, we wear the world like a loose garment. Everything makes sense. Things shift. We're internal shift in consciousness where we're saying, okay, this is my path. I'm clear on my purpose for a long time now. With all the challenges, life being problematic, I'm clear on my purpose. All said and done, this is what I do. This is where God sends me, to go feed his children. And every time I feed one of God's children, I go away with a full belly. And the world feels right. It feels right. It doesn't appear right. It feels right. It's right. Living with purity, honesty, unselfishness, and love. It's right. For the first time, I'm going to be 53 next week. Somebody says, how's it feel? As you want to know the truth, we can kid around about the age and all that stuff. My life feels right. And there's tons of challenges. My life feels right because of God. It's right. Everything I do, my relationship, just, it's right. It took all this time to say, I'm not a mistake. It's right. In this moment, I realized in the back of a hallway, I got to call my dad. The only guy on the entire planet who's going to come look for me in this condition would be my dad. So I made a couple of, tried to make a couple of collect calls. Um, Weeping, hang up the phone. Weeping, hang up the phone. My dad was about, I don't know, three, four hours from where I was in a place called Atlantic City, New Jersey. He was spending a week in there with his wife. And uh, while he was gambling, uh, he tells me he had this, what he called a feeling in his gut. That's how he described it. And he told his wife, my son Peter's in trouble. I, I got to go find him. I don't know what it is. I just have to go find him. God connects dots. Huh? Always connecting dots for us. When we don't know how to or have the power to do it. Because the path has to be walked. And so he dropped her off. He came looking for me. And he found me because God connected the dots. And I was running through the streets, desperate. If I live to be a 100, I'll never be as old as the day I walked into AA. I hadn't bathed. I hadn't eaten. I looked like someone who was suffering from untreated alcoholism. 
about 130 pounds, 140 pounds, about 40 pounds, maybe more than I weigh now, uh, less than I weigh now. And um, my dad got out of the car, and this time he just walked across the street and called me like anyone who couldn't find their son. You know, I just walked across the street. I remember saying, Dad, I'm okay, and then I collapsed. I remember collapsing in his arms. I remember very mindful my dad was holding me up. Mm. Our roots grasp, grasp new soil, and sometimes the worst moments of our life, what appears to be the worst moments of our life, when the hand is reached out and we finally grab on, we don't care where we're going, when the intent is pure, it's not tainted with any ego, it's not tainted with when I do this, this is going to happen. When we grab on and hold on, and I held on to my dad that night, the roots were grasping new soil, not only for me, but for him. Because his life was changed forever, for the better, because of my fellowship, because of the awakened spirit that God was going to allow me to experience. Experience him. It didn't feel that way. But the moment was a father reaching out to a son. There were no threats. There was no anger. I have a son who's dying. The same way my heavenly father sees us dying. His sons and daughters says, hold on. And I don't believe, you can challenge me on this. I don't believe that you have to knock all the time for God to come in. God, my God, will, my God's from New York. He will kick the door open. Right? And I always think if one of our brothers or sisters or our children, God forbid, were in the next room killing themselves, would we wait for an invitation? At that moment, the invitation's been set up. Go help. Kick a door open. We'll clean up the mess later. We'll clean up your rank with me later. We'll clean up that I broke a boundary and invaded your pride. I don't care. Right now I'm pulling you off the ledge. That's what God did for me in June 23rd, 1980. And the messenger was my dad, who's not a God guy, who's not a recovering guy, just a guy, a tough guy. Our roots grass new saw and off I went to treatment number seven. It was the last one. And after 10 days of being in there, my mind was not done. I wanted a drink. Just one more drink. One more little Mr. Boston. One more Jack Daniels and I can go to group. And God removed me from there and put me in Minnesota. I went to more treatment. All told, almost 11 months. And I came home to Brooklyn, New York. I found my first teacher. And as soon as I asked him to sponsor me, thinking it would be, sure, let's get going. We'll go to a dining. He says, he gave me a couple of, uh, 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 I call them Tonyisms, very earthy language. He says, before I sponsor you, you need to go home and read the preface to page 164, and you'll see how they talk about that and working with others. And when you're done, you call me. If you feel like using, he says, you call me. He says, I'm, give me your number. I'll be calling you, but I will start sponsorship when you complete this reading. And we would see each other at meetings and take me out into a diner and see how I was doing. Uh, completed the reading. He asked me a question. Think your alcoholic your life's unmanageable? I said, yes. Do you want help? I said, yes. He said, are you willing to go to any lines to get recovered? I said, yes. He's now I'll sponsor you. And we began from the cover of the book to page 164. And somewhere in there, I don't know the day, the time, the moment, but somewhere in there, life took on new meaning. And I realize I haven't thought about a drink in a really long time or any other kind of substance. I was eating and bathing regularly. And I went back to work. I was living on my brother's couch. My brother moved from that apartment to a little studio. And I had a little thing on that. I would sleep on the floor. When he'd go away for the weekend, he says, take my bed. My brother was kind enough to say, I'll sleep on the floor. You take my bed. And I was living with my kid brother. He was paying the rent till I kind of got uh, some money. And I had a little spot with my books. And I saved up some money. And my first night in my own apartment was a studio apartment. There were no shades on the wall, on the windows. There was no, it was nothing. It was just a bare apartment like when you first move in. Someone in AA gave me a sleeping bag. And there was a little 12-step uh, bookstore in my town, and I got a bunch of AA bumper stickers, and I just had them, and I put them on the door, and I had something that represents my higher power up on a door. I got into the sleeping bag with a big book and scripture. I put my head back. I was in paradise. I was in paradise. I didn't have a phone. There was nothing. You know, coffee. There was nothing. First night. It was one of the best nights I've ever had in my entire life because I was part of my fellowship. 
I was sober. I was not thinking about drinking. I had a great sponsor, and I was part of this. And I had great hope for the next day that I was going to repeat good stuff again. This was great. Going from sleeping behind a garbage pail in a filthy hallway, hiding so no one bothers me, to sleeping in a place that I just bought and it's clean. I took a shower. I ate. How great is that? That's what my God did for me. That's all I got. Peace.